Great. Thanks very much, Donal. And I'd like to... Uh... Thank the uh, organisers for the uh, great honour of giving the Osman Lecture for 2019. I'm not quite so grateful for the title, which was their title, not mine, because it sounds a little bit as if either the lifetime or the research, or both, are about to come to an end, and I hope neither of those will be the case in the next uh, half hour anyway. <laughs> so, uh, most of this work has been done at uh, the Hammersmith Hospital, uh, more recently under the aegis of Imperial College. So, a word about Arthur Osman, who was a remarkable man, who trained and practised at Guy's, which is nice, because I did as well. Uh, and after the war, he set up the first uh, renal unit, which was in Pembury Hospital. He was very interested in glomerulonephritis, so he must have been a very good guy. He did a lot of work on Bright's disease uh, and post-scarlatinal nephritis. Uh, and it was due to, to uh, Osman that nephrology was, in fact, recognised by the Royal College as a specialty back in 1945, and he was one of the founders of the Renal Association. So he was a remarkable individual whom I never met. So I'm going to talk about anchor-associated vasculitis, and I'm going to quite briefly consider how we name and classify it and what causes it, and then spend a little more time uh, talking about how we treat it and the current outcomes. So vasculitis has been around a long time, even longer than me. And it was the first classic description by Cuswell and Meyer was in 1865. And they described a young man who died of a disease with peculiar rubbery thickenings of the arteries shown there in his stomach. Uh, and he called that periarteritis nodosa, and it later turned into PAN. In the German literature, Volville in uh, 1923 described what he thought was the microscopic form of this disease. And then Davson in uh, the UK in 1948 uh, called it microscopic polyarteritis. Despite that, the current ACR classification doesn't even contain microscopic polyarteritis because, of course, it was described in Europe and not in America. And this has now turned into MPA. Uh, Klinger, in the early 1930s, described something he called granulomatous periarteritis, followed closely by Wegener, who described rhinogenic granulomatosis. These were almost certainly the same disease, initially called Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, and then nowadays known as GPA. And finally, Churg and Strauss, in 1949, which is great, because I was alive, just, um, described allergic granulomatosis and periarteritis, uh, later known as Churg-Strauss syndrome, and then EGPA. Of course, ANCA uh, hadn't been heard of during all this time. ANCA is a very recent thing through which many of us have lived. Uh, and ANCA was probably first described in the early 1980s by Davies in a series of patients in Australia with uh, crescentic GN and Ross River virus infection. And we don't quite know the relevance of that infection to this day. But the classical description was in uh, 1985 by Focko van der Waude, who described cytoplasmic or Cianca in Wegener's granulomatosis. This was followed fairly shortly by Falk and Jeanette at Chapel Hill, who described perinuclear or Pianca in other forms of vasculitis and crescentic GN. Uh, we, was, we started to do ANCA testing in our laboratory, and in fact set up a diagnostic test in the late 1980s. And by 1991, Jill Gaskin was one of the first to publish that ANCA correlate with disease activity. At about that time, we set up an EEC, as it was then, group for standardization of ANCA assays. And that doesn't sound very dramatic, but in fact it was. We obtained funding from the EU. We got to know every restaurant in Brussels by repeated trips to the chief, chief of research for the EU, who lived in Brussels. Uh, and eventually we set up this group which later evolved into the uh, exis VAS trial, the European Community Vasculitis Trial Group, and then into the Vasculitis Study Group, and it's now the European Vasculitis Society, headed up currently by David Jane, who was at some of these early meetings. There were two subsequent consensus meetings um, about the definition of what, what we should call ANCA, and in 1999 it was thought we did screening by fluorescence and then the specificity by ELISA, and more recently, there's been another meeting suggesting that we should go straight to various either solid phase or bead-based 
antigen-specific assays. Just to remind you, ANCA is seen sometimes in other conditions, uh, often not with PR3 or MPO specificity. And one of our favourite chronic infections is bacterial endocarditis, which Steve McAdoo wrote up a series uh, not so long ago. And of course, that's important because it would be an awful mistake to heavily immunosuppress someone with bacterial endocarditis. Uh, and so, you know, the use of the echocardiogram is kind of almost mandatory when you're first seeing a, a patient with vasculitis. There's lots of other possible targets other than MPO and PR3. And LAMP2 is, is one of my favourites, first described by Andy Reese's group. And LAMP2 is consistently found in series of patients in Europe and is never found in series of patients in America, which leads to very interesting discussions at the uh, ANCA workshop. So those early meetings led on to a series of anchor workshops. And when they started, they were anchor workshops. We all took materials, we took our results, we discussed them. It was a proper workshop. They, they, they then evolved into considering the treatment of small vessel vasculitis. And more recently, they've embraced large vessel vasculitis as well. So they're now more sort of big vasculitis meetings rather than anchor workshops. And I had the privilege of co-chairing Two of these, one back in 1993 with the late Martin Lockwood, uh, and then one again in uh, more recently, 2015, with Alan Salama. And much of what I'm going to say about treatment, about the trials, about the diagnosis, comes from the collaborations and the friendship set up during all these meetings. There's been lots of attempts to classify vasculitis, but for nephrologists, I think we need to keep it simple. Uh, and I think this one, which I contributed to, is the easiest one. It's the Chapel Hill Consensus Conference. Uh, and what it does is it divides up uh, vasculitis according to the size of vessel affected and then provides a small series of clinical definitions, which I, I don't have time to run through. <clears throat> At the time of the last Chapel Hill meeting, we separated off anchor-associated vasculitis, recognising that they're not all anchor-positive, but they're anchor-associated vasculitis, and I also managed to get anti-GBM disease included in the diagram, which was a great achievement. And I'm really, really sorry I can't talk about anti-GBM disease today, because it's probably still my favourite, although vasculitis is close. But you may have heard Steve McAdoo earlier in the week give a very good talk about anti-GBM disease. So once we defined it, we could work out the incidence, and you'll see in the UK here, Nottingham and Norwich, it's about 20 cases per million per year. So it's rare, but not ultra rare. In comparison, good pastures is one to two cases per million per year. So the prevalence uh, in the UK is about 250 patients per million population. So in, in the context of our vasculitis clinic, that certainly seems a lot. We seem to be seeing most of those. So what causes vasculitis? Now, a sensible researcher nowadays would probably decide to focus on genetics uh, or perhaps on T-cell biology or something like that. And of course, <laughs> I grew up in the day when you did everything. So I've done genetics, immunity, inflammation, pathology, and so on, uh, which is why you, know, you can be an all-rounder but without being an expert at anything. But then Stokes and Flintoff were good all-rounders. So, <laughs> Genetics first, briefly. So we did the first GWAS, uh, led by Ken Smith, um, at Cambridge. And the results were astoundingly interesting because for GPA, we found uh, an MHC link, which is what you'd expect, and also linkages to um, proteinase 3, the autoantigen, and alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is its natural inhibitor physiologically. So whereas some GWASs, you, you get a hit on a genetic uh, interval and there's nothing there of any interest, here the hits we got were all highly relevant to the disease. In MPA, we only got a hit in the MHC. There were stronger associations with either PR3 and MPO anchor than with the clinical diagnoses. And that's led some people to suggest we reclassify these as MPO AAV and PR3 AAV, but not everyone agrees. The Americans followed us, as is often the case. Uh, any nice American colleagues here? Anyway, they followed us. They found the same findings. But they also identified uh, PTPN22, which is an immune regulatory gene found in other autoimmune diseases. And most recently, again led by Ken Smith, uh, 
We've done a cross-phenotype study looking at both small and large vessel vasculitis, again identifying MHC, and this time identifying KDM4C, which is a histone demethylase. So this is involved in epigenetic regulation of the immune responses. So that's what I'm going to say about genetics. So what about ANCA, and are they pathogenic? So my friend Charles Jeanette would say 100%. I would say 90-ish percent. I'm convinced they're pathogenic. They're certainly specific and sensitive uh, for vasculitis, and the pattern and specificity generally correlate with clinical features and diagnosis, as shown in these uh, pictures of C. anchor here and P. anchor. Levels correlate with disease activity, and rising levels predict relapse. And don't believe articles where they say, oh, it's not a very good correlation. That's because they are usually non-renal series or unselected series in an unselected medical clinic, where that might be true. But in a renal series or a vasculitis clinic, there's a good correlation. And reducing those levels is associated with improvement. And the development of ANCA following induction by drugs, cocaine is the uh, favorite one at the moment, is strongly associated with subsequent development of vasculitis. And there's one reported case of maternal fetal transfer. So all of that clinical evidence really adds up to the fact uh, that ANCA are pathogenic and therefore controlling their production or removing them is good. However, we mustn't forget the T cell, which is required to help the antigen-specific and class-switched B cells. I won't go through the TB interaction here. There's also T cell infiltrates and granulomas, which is a Th1-type thing on biopsy. And we were amongst the first, Megan Griffith, I don't know if Megan's in the crowd, uh, first described autoreactive T cells in vasculitis. These were higher in patients than controls, and their frequency declines on recovery. And then working with uh, Alan Salama and Ruth Pepper, we went on to show that it was TH17 cells that were primarily activated in active disease. We also showed there's a reduced frequency of regulatory cells, Tregs and Bregs, allowing unrestricted activation of the effector cells. And again, Ken Smith's group, because Ken sort of focused a bit more on the genetics, found the, uh, there's a good CD8 T cell transcription factor for T cell exhaustion, and that's strongly predictive of whether the patient's going to relapse or not. So if you've got a chronic viral infection, you do not want to have exhausted T cells, because you won't clear it. If you've got vasculitis, you really want your T cells to be exhausted, because you're not going to relapse. So what do ANCA do when they hit the neutrophil? Um, so in this cartoon, uh, I've shown some of the things that we and others have shown that ANCA do. And I wish I could give you all their names and all the papers, but there just isn't time. So when they're stimulated via these various uh, signaling molecules, including spleen tyrosine kinase, of which more later, they release cytokines and uh, damage-associated molecular patterns like calprotectin, reactive oxygen species, enzymes. They activate complement through the alternative pathway. Uh, apoptosis is dysregulated, and instead they undergo netosis and, and release uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. They become less deformable. They get stuck in the small vad vessels. They migrate across the endothelium. They can kill endothelial cells. So all of this, again, backs up the clinical data that the ANCA are indeed pathogenic. Now, I'm just going to show you two examples because there isn't time to show you any more. Uh, and one of this is some of the work that we did, uh, starting off with Alan, but now Teresa Page, looking at calprotectin levels. And calprotectin is a damp. And calprotectin binds to RAGE, uh, the receptor for advanced glycation end products, and activates cells and potentiates the effects of ANCA. And calprotectin is very high in patients with active disease, less so in remission. And calprotectin is normally inhibited in the circulation by a substance called soluble S or S RAGE. And S RAGE levels are very low in active vasculitis. And the receptor, RAGE, is highly expressed in tissue with, of patients with active disease. So here we've got this uh, dangerous associated molecule in high levels, unopposed by its inhibitor, binding to high levels of this receptor and potentiating injury. And obviously interfering with the calprotectin rage pathway is a, a therapeutic avenue we're exploring. So I mentioned SICK, uh, which is one of our favorites. Uh, a lot of work in our group, led by Fred Tam, uh, concerns SICK. This is work from Maria Prendecki. Uh, who looked at patient neutrophils and found that the phosphorylated SICK, which is the active form, was significantly raised in active disease 
falls during remission, and ANC can stimulate normal neutrophils to phosphorylate sick. And when we use our, uh, one of our sick inhibitors, R406, we can block the effect of anchor on the neutrophil. Uh, and this here shows a dose-dependent inhibition of IL-8 production by neutrophils, and this shows inhibition of reactive oxygen species release. So again, highly encouraging uh, that sick may be a good target therapeutically in future trials. So I was torn about whether I made this slide or not, because I love using other people's slides, and I thought, as it's the Osman lecture, I've just got to make a slide. So Ansley, my personal assistant, and everyone else in the group has been suffering for a, a number of weeks trying to make this slide, <laughs> which shows that inflammation or infection prime and activate neutrophils, which then upregulate and release their antigens, PR3 and MPO, which are taken up by dendritic cells or B cells, presented to T cells, which then help the B cells make anchor, which activate your monocytes and your neutrophils, to release the various things, pro-inflammatory molecules I described before, uh, in particular complement activation and net formation, and the T cells themselves can be directly cytotoxic, either through macrophage activation or through CD8 cytotoxicity. So that was our, that's all I really did to prepare for this talk. I had the other slides, I just made this uh, new picture. So how do we treat vasculitis? Well, in the 50s and 60s, it was a, an acute and lethal disease. It killed you. Um, one year survival was about 15%. Then, in the 1970s at the NIH, uh, Fauci and his colleagues um, transformed the outcome by introducing prednisolone and cyclophosphamide, to which there was a response in up to 90% of people. Um, at Hammersmith, Martin Lockwood and others, we introduced plasma exchange for severely affected cases. Uh, then the UVAS trials came online, and UVAS was really ahead of the game worldwide in doing these trials. It was then followed by more global trials of rituximab uh, and other biological agents. And although I won't be talking about it, I want to emphasize our increasing emphasis on patient-reported outcomes and attempts to personalize treatment in this disease, as in any other, of course, and the benefits of a multidisciplinary vasculitis clinic where we can call on the expertise of our friends in ENT, ophthalmology, and so on. So anchor vasculitis, as you know, starts off with segmental fibrinoid necrosis, which turns into crescents, and sometimes you're lucky enough to see fibrinoid necrosis of a vessel. And the, the lesions are all of different ages, unlike anti-GBM disease, where it's very monomorphic, uh, this is very variable. Of course, although we're nephrologists, uh, in the vasculitis clinic, we have to manage many other complications. Uh, and up here, you can see that uh, eye and ENT disease, uh, shown in this uh, patient in this scan, can be very severe. So you may call it limited, but you wouldn't call it mild. That patient would not describe a disease as mild. And you get severe lung hemorrhage, uh, which is, again, a major indication for aggressive treatment. So in UVAS, uh, we decided that we would subgroup uh, patients according to severity. We give high-intensity treatment to induce remission and then low-intensity for maintenance. We agreed a standard regimen by consensus and tested it against the best alternative through RCTs. And when it's said quite quickly, that sounds awfully easy. And if you sit in a room full of people from all the different countries in Europe, from France, from Germany, from the Netherlands, uh, and try and reach a consensus, uh, you, like Theresa May and many others, find it's not possible. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to be the chair of the clinical trials group when this was set up. And in those days, we had things called blackboards. I don't know, Donal will remember what a blackboard is. And so I listened to the discussion going on in French, German, whatever other language. And as an English speaker, I had a bit of an advantage. So I summarized their thoughts on the blackboard. But of course, what I wrote on the blackboard was what I wanted to write on the blackboard. <laughs> it didn't bear much relation to, to what they said. So that's how trials are developed nowadays. So I'm going to cover these quite briefly um, because these are all published and well known. So we showed methotrexate could be used for early or limited disease. Plasma exchange uh, helped renal survival in patients with advanced disease in the MEPEX. Intravenous cyclophosphamide was non-inferior 
to oral. Uh, and then there were the two rituximab studies showing rituximab was non-inferior to cyclophosphamide. And a more recent induction studies, you may be familiar with the CLEAR study, work on Avacapan, published recently by, by David Jane. And the strategy here was quite cunning. Uh, first of all, they halved the prednisolone and added some Avacapan to make sure there was no safety signals and everything was tolerated. And they then switched to use Avacapan instead of prednisolone. And generally, the BVAS, the proteinuria, and the urinary MCP1 all fell more rapidly in patients receiving the Vacapan than in standard prednisolone. And there's now, as you know, a phase three study called Advocate, seeing whether this blocker of C5A receptor will be something to move into clinical practice. There's also the long-awaited MySite study, <coughs> looking at a large number of patients with, uh, who we excluded patients with severe kidney disease, they had either MMF or IV cyclophosphamide followed by azathioprine. And interestingly, the time to remission was the same, but those patients with MMF relapsed more than those who had cyclophosphamide. But at least it gives us another alternative for patients with milder disease. Um, now, Steve McAdoo has done lots of work on, on this. We decided we would combine rituximab and low-dose IV cyclophosphamide because the IV cyclophosphamide works more qu quickly which is important in severe kidney disease, whereas the rituximab gives sustained uh, control of the disease. Uh, so we combined these two, and we found excellent remission rates of 94% at six months and a very sustained fall in B cells beyond a year. And you'll see patient and renal survival were absolutely excellent. The renal survival here was 95%, and relapses in five-year follow-up were extremely rare. Uh, only 15% had a severe relapse. And compared with a propensity-matched cohort from the UVAS trials, this regimen showed a reduced risk of death, renal failure, or relapse. So we were encouraged by this. We'd used a rapidly tapering steroid uh, protocol, and we decided we'd taper the steroids even more quickly. Uh, and this is called our glucocorticoid minimizing regimen, recently published by Ruth Pepper, because this work's been done mainly with Alan Salama and Mark Little. Uh, and here we gave the same combination of rituximab and cyclophosphamide and only one or two weeks of oral prednisolone between the two doses of rituximab. So you couldn't forget it. You gave it between the rituximabs. Again, you got a remission in 96%, sustained depletion of B cells. As a, a, a warning, four patients did require introduction for prednisolone. So it doesn't work in 100% of cases, but nearly all of these patients on long-term follow-up have stayed off prednisolone. So you do not need high doses of prednisolone for maintenance in these patients. And what Steve did then, he's compared the long-term outcome of the glucocortoid minimizing protocol with cyclovas, which uses a low but more conventional dose of steroids, and the survival, renal failure-free survival, relapse rate were identical. So dropping the steroids didn't make any difference. Uh, however, the B cells did come back a bit more quickly. And Alan Salam is now leading a, an application for a trial called Savannah, uh, where we will be trying that in a randomized way. I have to mention Pexivas, um, although it hasn't been published yet, because um, Pexivas was a very large trial of vasculitis, randomizing people to receive plasma exchange or not, and then reduced dose or standard dose steroids to see whether plasma exchange reduced the combined endpoint of death or renal failure and was reduced glucocorticoids non-inferior to standard. And the results, I have to say, surprised me a little bit because the plasma exchange group had an identical long-term survival as the control group, but this was a combined point, endpoint of renal failure or death. But you can see in the first year there is quite clear separation between those two lines, and further analysis of the patients with severe renal failure and those with alveolar hemorrhage is ongoing. So I'm not writing off the fact there may be uh, a short-term effect. Uh, however, on the, on the bright side, the glucocorticoids, the reduced dose, was just as good as the standard dose, uh, with more evidence to the fact you really, really don't need to kill patients with steroids. So a brief comment on um, maintenance trials. Um, Cycazorem showed that azathioprine could be used instead of cyclophosphamide. You're also familiar with that. You don't find it surprising. It was surprising when we did it. 
And our German colleagues were very resistant to the idea of doing this. Uh, in America, they tried etanercept, which is a soluble TNF receptor, and that didn't work, which doesn't mean infliximab won't work, because they're different drugs. Um, but I don't have time to go into that. Um, and back in Europe, we found methotrexate was equivalent to azathioprine. MMF was not quite as good as azathioprine, uh, but it's OK. Uh, and then the maintenance study, main Ritzan, by the French vasculitis group, showed that regular dosing with rituximab was more effective than azathioprine for maintenance. And there's just a couple of uh, recent studies to show you that remain. And this is where patients were either stopped maintenance after two years or carried on for four years. It was very slow to recruit because it, it, it appeared like a fairly boring study. But in fact, it was very interesting. And this shows survival without relapse by treatment arm. And those in whom you withdraw treatment, even after two years, have a significant relapse rate compared with those where you carry on. So you weigh up your risks and benefits. Do you want the patient to have the side effects of treatment or do you want them to relapse? Now, obviously, you want neither, but we're not yet at that stage. And those where you withdrew treatment when the anchor was positive relapsed more than it did when it was negative. So always look at the anchor when taking that sort of decision. And finally, the French main Ritzan 2 study um, showed that when you tailor rituximab according to B cells and anchor levels, rather than just giving it every six months, it was just as effective uh, as when you did, did, gave it regularly, but you ended up using a lower dose uh, of rituximab. So if I summarise current approaches, um, prednisolone with methotrexate or MMF, prednisolone with cyclophosphamide or rituximab, although there's no evidence that rituximab alone works in severe renal disease, or you can adopt the combined uh, cyclophosphamide and rituximab approach. And for patients with dialysis-dependent disease or alveolar hemorrhage, we are currently still using plasma exchange, and I think you should wait till the PECVAS paper is published and the analyses done before you change your practice. For maintenance, azathioprine, MMF, or methotrexate, or rituximab regularly, or in the tailored approach. So I have to show, oh, actually, a lot of other drugs are being investigated, which in the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to describe. These are all actively being pursued. However, I have to show one rat slide so this is our rat model of experimental autoimmune vasculitis, showing that spleen tyrosine kinase inhibition reduces, when introduced at day 21, sorry, so introduced when disease has started, but pretty late, reduces proteinuria and hematuria, improves significantly the renal histology, uh, and reduces infiltration by ED1-positive macrophages. So again, this is a very reproducible now and reliable animal model of vasculitis where sick really works. So we've absolutely got to start a clinical trial. And what about long-term outcome? Um, in the UVAS study, we, we did a, a, a long-term follow-up led by Oliver Flossman, uh, and we found that although patients have a pretty good five-year survival rate now, 70% or so, they still have a mortality ratio of 2.6 compared to the normal population shown here. And he showed that both age and CKD stage were important. Um, we've done our own little follow-up uh, with Nish Awakumaran uh, of 563 patients with vasculitis in our clinic. Um, a severe bunch of patients, 30% on dialysis, 20% with alveolar hemorrhage, treated very consistently with Pred, Cyclo, and or Rituximab, and using plasma exchange only for se severe disease. So we got a patient survival of 87% at one year and 76% at five years. And we found, through multivariable analysis, predictors of outcome. And age was one of the most important, uh, those all over 70 doing worse. But in separate studies, which we've also published, they still do better when you treat them than if you don't treat them. So don't be put off treating elderly patients, please. Um, Decade of presentation was significant. And remember, this is multivariable. This was adjusted for renal failure and everything else. Um, and yet, the five-year survival uh, in the last decade is now up to about 90%. And this improvement has occurred 
subsequent to the introduction of ANCA and subsequent to, the, to many of the UVAS studies, and it's probably where using the drugs uh, better and maybe rituximab has had a little bit of effect, but not much in this cohort. Patients on dialysis do worse, patients with alveolar hemorrhage do worse. Uh, and final data slide from Anisha Tanner, we looked at those patients with severe disease, creatinine over 500 are on dialysis, and you'll see that the over 500s, their renal survival at one year is over 90%, so they do incredibly well, and it's still nearly 75% at five years. Those on dialysis do less well, but nearly 60% come off dialysis. And this is pretty remarkable, because certainly when I started doing this, they didn't come off dialysis so much. Uh, and now 60% do, and that's sustained at over 40% by five years. And what's also interesting is that if you look at either patient survival or renal survival, those with a creatinine over 500, but not dialyzing, did significantly better than those on dialysis. Now, whether that suggests that the dialysis is uh, further harming kidney function or just that you need to get on and treat them early, I'm not sure. But the message is if you get on and treat them before they're on dialysis, their outlook's going to be better. So, in conclusion, I think the strong clinical and experimental evidence that ANCA are pathogenic in AAV. They may not be in other conditions. So the autoimmune response depends on effector T cells, particularly TH17s balanced by regulatory uh, subsets. The immunogenesis, what kicks it off, is uncertain, but you undoubtedly need a triggering event uh, and background genetic susceptibility. Um, many of these mechanisms involving complement neutrophils and monocytes are increasingly well understood, in particular the role of classical versus non-classical monocytes. And I really, really would have loved to have time to show you some of Tabby Turner-Stokes' work, but I didn't about the role of um, non-classical monocytes. And rodent model, models of AAV allow mapping disease pathways and testing new therapies. So standard induction therapy should be with prednisolone and either cyclophosphamide or rituximab. I've given you promising results, but it's not a controlled trial, of rituximab and low-dose IV cyclophosphamide. And we've had some successful attempts at minimizing corticosteroids, which from a patient's viewpoint is probably the most important thing we've done. The role of plasma exchange remains unclear. Let's wait for Pexivas to be published. Maintenance therapy can be with AZA, MMF, or methotrexate, but in those who uh, relapse a lot or, or who can't tolerate these drugs, regular or tailored rituximab is effective. There's lots of new therapeutic targets being examined, particularly complement components uh, and various pro-inflammatory cytokines. And our data and others show that the long-term outcomes, fortunately for our patients, continue to improve. So I'd like to thank uh, the people who sort of inspired my interest in vasculitis uh, and anti-GBM disease, Keith Peters, Andy Reese, and the late uh, Martin Lockwood, particular credit to Martin, who died at an extremely young age, as, as you all know, and who, was le who led our anchor-related research. All of the other people in this uh, box are people who I've worked with at Hammersmith and whose names I discovered in papers that were long forgotten. The only thing I'm sure about is I will have forgotten someone, and all I can do is apologize to them for doing that. Uh, David, Jane, Mark Little, and Alan Salam have been my most uh, steadfast collaborators recently, together with everyone in UQVAS, UVAS, uh, and the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium. These are the consultants who currently work in our clinic, uh, although I also want to thank all of my other medical and nursing colleagues who help with all the patients. And this bunch of uh, people is a laboratory group. Uh, it's impossible to get them all together in one place, although we did try just before the talk, which is why they've each got little individual pictures. Um, I know I shouldn't pick anyone out, but I really, really have got to mention Angeli, who's been my personal assistant for longer than both of us want to remember. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank all our funders throughout the years, and last but not least, of course, all of my patients, which is the reason I kept doing this for so long. Thank you very much for your attention and for staying to the end.